Okay, well, here we are in chapter number 12. And, uh, of course, you remember that these chapters are according to the chapters listed in Life Through His Name by Welch, which is our text that we're using for this study. And just by the way, we, um, Seppi and I, we've been going out to Lake Thunderbird and enjoying especially the evenings. And, um, of course, the beautiful sunsets are there. And also, we've noticed the coming of the dragonfly. And the, there are plenty of them there. And I enjoy watching them, their wings buzzing. And then what they'll do is they'll turn them off for a couple of seconds and glide and then start them up again. And they're so versatile in how they maneuver as they chase after the little bugs um, that are swarming also in the air. Of course, we are going through our study thinking about questions related to the book, John, the gospel, the fourth gospel. And um, it's got so many great things in it, but there's some very, very important questions that we need to ask ourselves. One of which is... Uh, what is this book about and who is it addressing and what need is it fulfilling and um, we know for example that we are a part of a family um, and that family has a hope in the heavenly places and the the one who brings this message to us is paul the prisoner there's a specific adoption there's a predestination and in, uh, including the inheritance. But what about the hope of those that assume John is speaking to them? What is their hope? And we are asking and answering, hopefully, some of these questions as we go along. This is the text. It's a great text. Make sure you're reading it. Uh, there's there's uh, some very in-depth work being presented here and great scholarship very cool summaries lots of linking passages and lots of structural um, discussions to give us some scope and this one here is also good because it answers uh, some objections that people might rise raise and uh, this is actually made from a little discussion between welsh and another gentleman about uh, the uh, Mystery and John's Gospel. It's a pretty good book. This one by Dr. McLean, which we will look at soon, and it does overlap many of the ideas we're looking at. This one here, the Par Parable, Miracle, and Sign by Welsh, is also an excellent booklet. I'll be quoting and cutting and pasting a lot from life through his name in these uh, slides. And this is one of them. And we're basically um, in this section, which is huge. You can see the, the tremendous amount of material between B and A. So there's a big gap, this linking uh, portion of the scriptures between the seventh and the eighth sign. And that's where we're at. So tremendous material here. I pointed out there's a bit of a uh, linking, uh, sorry, not a linking, but a little bit of a problem with the formatting of the, the this passage here in terms of the structure, um, but we can we can make sense of it. It's been very interesting here where you've got the italicized D and the normal D, where what you've got here is I go, I come, and then I ascend. With the ascension. Um, and then the final disappearance of the Lord Jesus Christ from the earth, of course, raises some big issues. Um, many issues as to well, what's going to happen now. What provision will the Lord give for his own um, in, in the fact that he leaves the earth? And so we're going to look at some of those issues. Now, as I pondered what I've read and a lot of what I'm thinking about, I want to just preface my remarks by just looking at these two passages. This is John 2.22 2, 
um, which you can you can look up John chapter 2 and verse 22 and it says this um, in the context we read from verse 18 then answered the Jews and said unto him what sign showest thou unto us seeing that thou doest these things Jesus answered and said unto them destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up then said the Jews forty and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days but he spake of the temple of his body when therefore he was risen from the dead his disciples remembered now what I want you to think about is this idea of remembering you may have lots of problems with remembering um, um, I, I seem to get a little bit worse at that as, as time has gone on although uh, not too bad but notice this, um, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. Now look at the consequence. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now notice the, the results of remembering and the fact of the consequence of remembering in terms of belief is remarkable and notice that it's it's keyed in to the resurrection of Jesus in John 12 another interesting passage this is John chapter number 12 and verse 16 um, we read back a little bit from verse 12 on the next day much people that were come to the feast when they heard that jesus was coming to jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried hosanna blessed is the king of israel that cometh in the name of the lord see this is a, a, a tremendous prophetical thing concerning the king and jesus when he had found a young ass uh sat thereon as it is written fear not daughter of zion behold thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt these things understood not his disciples at the first but when jesus was glorified then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him all things change once this resurrection occurs this glorification that happens the ultimate glorification of jesus and it's the resurrection of christ which is often referenced as his glorification and uh, remembrance comes on this when you remember that jesus came up from the dead you are instantly changed you become someone different you feel the life that is to come for you despite what's happening in your own body with remembrance comes joy comfort and service it's a great motivator isn't it to know that uh, you've got life in him and that he rose from the dead as the uh, first to come up with immortality. He's the first fruits of them which sleep. Um, so we can note, take a lot of note from um, this, especially for, for us who are in a different family. Um, if you look at Philippians uh, chapter 1, Philippians is parallel to Hebrews. It's, it's basically a book about service and, and running the race. And if you look at Philippians chapter 1, it says this in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So here's Paul remembering about the Philippians. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy. And notice he's got joy in him. And this is the man who is in jail. 
and it says for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now from the first day until now this great continuance of faith and notice he talks about the gospel and of course without the resurrection of christ there is no gospel if christ be not raised then you are yet in your sins and you have no hope but because christ came up from the dead the gospel is real the gospel has effect and with it joy joy in chapter 1 verse 25 it says and having this confidence i know that i shall abide and continue with with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith the joy of faith and without the resurrection where would your faith be joy comes ultimately because of the fact that jesus came up from the dead there's nice things in here about paul and his hope to be released from jail and come to them um, that's not my emphasis now however look at chapter 2 and verse 1 if there be therefore any consolation in christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind this of course is, is possible we can have this because jesus rose from the dead ultimately it comes to this and in verse 17 of the same chapter yea and if i be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith i joy and rejoice with you all isn't that amazing if i be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith then he would do so i joy and rejoice with you all for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me fantastic isn't it see that's the that's the kind of faith we want to encourage in this day and age where people are basically losing faith we have a fantastic savior and a message that is just beautiful and powerful chapter 4 verse 1 therefore my brethren dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown so stand fast in the lord my dearly beloved yeah this is the kind of thing that's possible because of the fact of christ and his resurrection and just to seal this back into john because i don't want to go too too long out of john i want you to come back to john and chapter 15 and verse 11 it says this these things have i spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full full isn't that amazing um not just to have joy but joy that would be full and we get this fullness uh, we get complete satiety in jesus and what a tremendous thing that Jesus would say this now one of the big things that's going on here in these chapters between the two signs and specifically I'm talking about chapters 13 14 15 and 16 in those chapters is a, a lot about a ministry to his own and a lot of people will not get this straight and they'll try and take passages out of here and try to put them to themselves as if uh, they were his own in the same way that the disciples were. A lot of what's going on in here relate exactly to the disciples. And in fact, I said chapter 16, but of course it continues into chapter 17. Chapter 17 is really the goal of those chapters 13, 14, 15, 16. Now, one of the things that I think Welch does, which I think is, is absolutely correct, to really understand what's going on in here, 
is to understand that there is this parenthesis that's going on. In the same way that Paul begins a prayer in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 1, and then gets off on this dis very important parenthesis and discussion about the mystery, and then in verse 14 gets back to the prayer. He resumes. He starts the prayer, and then suddenly, almost immediately, he starts it. He goes into this parenthesis, and then in verse 14, he then resumes it. And uh, let's just quickly look at that, because, because as I say, this, this does relate to John in the sense that something else very similar to this is going on. And if you have things that are similar and you can compare them, that's how you get understanding. You get most understanding about things when you can compare them. And when you understand the times and the seasons and uh, what hope we have and the age in which we live and the the laws of the household that apply to us, and then you can compare those with another age, so you begin to appreciate more the time in which we live and also the, the work of the Spirit in our lives. So if you look at chapter um, 3 and verse 1, um, it says this, um, well, I'll actually read just prior to that to keep with the, the outline in front of you. It says in verse 21 of the previous chapter, 221, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. For this cause I, Paul, the prison of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and then what he does is he gets into this parenthetical thing where he talks about the dispensation of the grace of God, which had given me to you it, how that by revelation. And <laughs> these are just absolutely fantastic passage, passages. They're in this parenthesis, though, for this cause. And then he gets into this parenthesis. And if you look at verse 14, he then resumes it. For this cause, I bow my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's prayerful, isn't it? Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Um, and he, he goes on that you would grant that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice he comes down to this idea of the pleroma, the fullness. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And here comes the end of the prayer. Amen. Isn't that amazing? So you have this parenthesis in verses 1 to 13. And then this, this resumation and this continuance of this fantastic prayer, which um, you know gives us so much instruction. Um, notice the in, in, in the instruction in the prayer, um, he says in verse sixteen that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, be uh, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, and uh, rooted and grounded in love. Uh, and verse 18, able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. You see, is this understand. In this prayer, my, this is a hugely dispensational prayer, isn't it? I mean, if you look at some of the prayers that go on in the Gospels and you compare with, with this, it's very, very different. So you can get a lot of instruction here about how it is that you should pray. So let's get back to our subject, though. I want to get back into John. So what you have is you have the same thing happen. Like if you go back to John 13, 
the same sort of thing, I mean. In John 13 uh, and verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which, notice, his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This is all about his own and his great love for them. It says in, in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. So the hour came, and here is the theme which is commencing. And then from verse 4 of chapter 13 to chapter 16, 33, you have this parenthesis when the disciples are instructed, encouraged, and prepared. And then when you go right across to chapter 17, then you find the hour has come. Um, and in chapter 17, you have this resumption again of the theme which began in uh, chapter 13. Uh, so if you look, uh, for example, chapter 17, these words, verse 1, uh, spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So here comes this glorification, which is uh, very evident in the, his resurrection and uh, a tremendous key idea that I began with. But at least for the structure of these intervening chapters, they form this great parenthesis. And you can see how that these are indeed linking to chapter 17. So chapters 13 to 16, they explain the topics of chapter 17, where chapter 17 is most definitely the high water mark. I mean, just read chapter 17. Just do it. I mean, you've got to do only 26 verses there. Beautiful portion of scripture. But what Welsh does in page 358 of Life Through His Name, he goes through these various topics showing you how that the intervening chapters link in with the great ideas of chapter 17 as far as time. Um, you know, the, the father, the uh, father, the hour has come. Now I am no more in the world and I come to thee, John 17, 1 and 11. And then you look at chapter 13, 1, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world under the father. And then he looked at it under the title of The Purpose. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And then in chapter 13, 1 and 13, 31, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. That's 13, 31. And then the world, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. In John 14, 19, the world seeth me no more. I am come into the world. Again, I leave the world. John 16, 28. Having loved his own, which were in the world. John 13, 1. And then the hatred of the world. You can see that in, in passages in John 15, 19 and John 17, 14. He also goes to the cleansing, the unity and the goal. And so you can see most definitely uh, that great discussion of topics in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, which then are summarized in a complete way in John 17, where John 17 is the goal. So this picture here, I think, would summarize more or less what's going on here. So John 13 to 16 is preparatory and foundational, and John 17 is the goal. There's tremendous structure in this. The Spirit of God inspires writers of the New Testament to write in a way where there is this tremendous scope exhibited by a structure. You need to find this to understand what's going on. And so here is the structure that uh, comes from page 360 about the Lord's witness to his own. Uh, John 13, 1 to 3, the Lord loved his own. The hour was come to part under the Father. 
and then finally the betrayal by by Judas. This this thing to do with Judas is a very very interesting thing. It's a sad thing, but in that it fulfills prophecy, it is also an encouraging thing. It shows you that Jesus is the Messiah. John 13, 4 to 15, 18, the cleansing. This has got to do with a tremendous picture. So there are metaphors which are brought out in events that happen in the Lord's life. And these, again, show his glorification by even the anointing with the spikenard by uh, Mary, uh, you'll find that that is again concerning events surrounding the death of Christ and his ultimate resurrection. And then uh, 15 to 9, 15, 19 to 17, 12, the world loves its own. The hours come, I come to thee, the son of perdition. And uh, then in John 17, 13 to 23, sanctify through thy truth. And there's no reference to Judas, and then perfected in one into one. And then the last portion about the betrayal, finally coming to the betrayal by Judas. Now, um, <clears throat> as I say, there is this whole business in here about the provision that the Lord is sending uh, to his own. Uh, in the fact that he would be leaving the earth and giving them the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is also the provision of Scripture, John 15, uh, 3. And let's just look at that together. So in John 15, 3, let's just um, read from verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Great metaphors being set up. Metaphors are everywhere. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might, may bring forth more fruit. See, look at this. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the purging is not simply to cut down and destroy, but rather to bring more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Wow. So that word is going to remain and it will continue its cleansing work. So there's a great provision of scripture here. But then as you uh, look back in here and forward, actually, uh, you find in these chapters, in these intervening chapters, which lead into chapter 17, this provision of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, parakletos, that he may abide with you forever. And then John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So it tells you, uh, the scriptures tell you who the comforter is. It is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to, you, to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. And you, we've discussed the effect of remembrance, right? Um, and so the Holy Spirit is, of course, going to help in bring things to remembrance and with this great joy and comfort. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Ah, so what is this great witness that's going to come from the Comforter? Well, he will testify of Christ. A lot of people get the wrong idea about the Holy Spirit, and they think that's the end. But the the idea here is that this, the Comforter is to testify uh, of Christ. He shall testify of me. And then in chapter 16 and 17, it, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, I should say, um, it says, uh, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, 
I will send him unto you. Notice it says send him. And he's referring to him, a person. That is the Holy Spirit is a person. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, um, this word parakletos uh, is an interesting word because para means alongside and kletos comes from the verb kaleo to call and so this is one called alongside as in a helper or a comforter yeah, as someone that will help you in a court of law someone called alongside and um, when you think about this uh, it is evident that this continued into the book of acts if you look at acts uh, chapter number one let's uh, look at acts chapter number one and let's see if we can find this uh, acts one and verse four it says and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Ah, yes, okay. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Okay, and this is the promise of the Father. Um, as it says in John 15, 26, proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And if you look a little bit further, look at... Uh, verse number eight but but ye shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses now notice this witnesses unto to me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth this what this is what the disciples were to do the the, the disciples were a special group his own and much of what you'll find in these chapters relate to this preparatory uh, ministry that the Lord had to his own to be witnesses. <clears throat> and going on in chapter 2 and verse 32, it says this, <clears throat> This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore whereof we all are witnesses. And in chapter 3, in verse 15, And killed the prince of life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And in chapter 5, and verse 32, it says this, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Well, you can you, you can multiply verses and see that indeed this is the uh, the continuation of what the Lord had prepared His own to do. It continues into the Book of Acts with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, let's look at this idea of context. If you go into say John fourteen verse one, look what it says. Uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, but believe also in me. And a lot of people will come to this and just take this out of the context and just say, you believe in God, believe also in me. You believe in God, believe also in me. But notice that there's a whole lot that went on before that. In verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, this is of the previous chapter and leading into chapter 14, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice that's the context and then immediately comes let not your heart be troubled ye believe in god believe also in me and this really is a statement to satisfy the need of peter specifically 
Now, I'm not saying you can't learn from this, you can't gain general application, but if you want to understand the meaning of the verse, you've got to find its context. And the Holy Spirit, of course, would bring this back to, to Peter's remembrance. Um, so John 13 to 17, page 361, you can see an, a neat little summary that you've got this uh, statement in the middle here, the imminence of his departure out of the world and between uh, either side of this is the unalterable love of the Lord for his own and the betrayal by Jesus. And as a little note I've got here, despite the attack of Satan through Judas, the Lord's love would continue despite his absence. Okay, cool. So during his absence, you have this sanctification, this washing, which has much teaching latent in it. So there is this teaching which is on the surface and then there's deeper, deeper material in here. And there's abiding in his love. So during his absence, there is the need for sanctification. There is the abiding in his love. And that would continue uh, with uh, the work of the Spirit. So in John 15, 7, it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So you see, this is very, very specific to his own, to his own disciples. And it shall be done unto you. Um, so if you read John 15, 15 and 19 and 27, you'll see that this is quite specific to the disciples. Let's have a look at that. John 15 and verse 15. Henceforth I call you not my not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. And it goes on, it says in verse 18, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hateth you. And in uh, verse 27, and, all, and ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. You have been with me from the beginning. The context here is his disciples. And um, so I mention this again, and also that in Acts one twenty two, <clears throat> beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness, notice, to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So after Judas had gone, there had to be another one taken. Um, and it says in chapter 15, 27 of John, and ye also shall, but shall be a witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So that's why you can see this great connection here that the, one of the uh, requirements um would be that this person would be there from the beginning, from the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us. And so there, there had to be one ordained amongst those people who had been from the beginning. And they appointed two, Joseph called Basabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Okay, so that's important to see. So you've got the specific outworking of the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, and we went through these passages, right? The Parakletos, the one called alongside the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And uh, the, he would be sent by Christ from the Father, the Spirit of Truth. And uh, so when you uh, understand the action of the Holy Spirit through the Gospels and through uh, the book of Acts, then you must also understand the distinction between the, the ages, our age, and what happened during the book of Acts. So it says in John 79, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. So look at this. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. So some people would say, well, the 
father doesn't really care the son doesn't really care for those of the world the world of the reprobate and it's only his own that he would pray for not the world the world's going to hell and there's nothing that can be done they were ordained before the foundation of the world for destruction and there was this um predestination that that's only some would be saved etc etc that kind of calvinistic uh, stuff that people push but if you look at john 17 and verse 18 it says this as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world so that's his disciples so when it says I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. He's talking about the disciples, because they have a specific job of witness to do, as he explains in verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So now... There is a prayer that extends to those who would believe from the preaching of the disciples. So God has his seasons. First of all, he wants to prepare his disciples and protect them. And he's going to pray for them because they're going out there like sheep among wolves. So uh, there is also this tremendous washing and there's knowledge. Look at the A's. Jesus knows. Uh, he knew verse 18 i know and then also you'll find in the seas um what i do thou knowest not now but thou shalt know hereafter and then down the sea know ye what i have done to you this is referring to the washing you see and verse uh, 17 if ye know these things happy are ye if ye do them now what is going on here well what's going on here is a great metaphor that was that is being played out here and it's a metaphor that re, that relates to the sacrifice of christ uh, in john 13 10 it says jesus saith to him he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet but is clean every whit and ye are clean but not all well judas is part of that not all and ye are clean but not all now it's interesting if you look at the greek so i put this down here um it says here and jesus so there's jesus says to him he who has been washed has no need except to wash his feet now this verb le luminos is perfect and it's passive he who has been washed he who has been washed you see it's perfect it's been done what i have written i have written it's it's done right it's all done it's finished it's completed and then down here it's got another different verb nipto and here this has to do with you know parts of the body the 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 feet for example maybe the hands maybe the face and there we have the prospect of other washings and other baptisms but the one that the one that saves is the one that completely washes and is finished and i think this is a fantastic thing that shows you uh something that points towards the completeness of the washing that people get through the finished work of christ and then there's a, the neat thing here about the uh, judas and the eastern covenant of bread that when you share bread with someone when you share a meal uh, then you have to show all due respect and concern and uh, all debts and liabilities as it were you you let go and there is this kiss of peace and what you have is is judas that he's sharing in this covenant of bread he that eateth bread with me he it is to whom i shall give a sop that's the covenant of bread a sop here being a piece of bread 
He then, having received the sop, there's the covenant of bread. And so what you have is this, this setting up of this tremendous uh, communal and uh, loving uh, covenant of bread, and then Judas betraying this. Um, and this comes up further uh, because the Lord repeats a passage which comes from Psalm 41 and verse 9. And it says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. That's Psalm 41, 9. And this is a, probably a reference to Ahithophel, who was David's counselor, and uh, he was not faithful to David, and went after Absalom, and actually gave him bad advice, and in the end, uh, that advice was not taken. And what did he do? Well, this is what it says. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. And that's, that's Ahithophel. And this is the type of Judas. And of course, Jesus is, is like David here. And this is a tremendous picture that's going on, again, giving us a witness to the fact and truth that Jesus is the true Messiah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that.